Good afternoon, class. Just a reminder, you're in a class called How Things Work. We're getting there. As you go about your daily life, you walk down the street, you now know it's gravity that holds you to the, to the earth, and that friction enables you to do just about anything. And if you run into something, you can think about that using momentum. And the important part of our life, cell phones and batteries, that runs on electromagnetism. So we are approaching a pretty solid understanding of a lot of the universe, of a, a lot of how things work. And so last class, uh, several classes ago, we started talking about electricity. And last class, I, we, I let you know that, hey, not all circuits are DC circuits. Now, I did mention that anything battery powered is going to be run, that uh, is going to be DC. DC. Batteries put out DC or direct current, just a nice steady stream of current. But for some really important reasons, the, bat, the, the power at the plug is AC. And that has, there's some important reasons for that, and it has some important implications that I want to continue to talk about today. So, yeah, let's do a quick review of where this whole electromagnetism com thing comes from. And by the way, uh, we actually did start talking about electromagnetism several weeks ago. So when we started talking about, maybe I'll even pull up a picture of our friend, the, where'd he go? The electromagnetic wave. I deleted my picture. Of, oh, there he is. So when we started talking about electromagnetic waves, we were talking about electromagnetism. I didn't really get into it, but you can't have one without the other. You can't have a wave of electric field. You can't have a wave of magnetic field. They are two sides of the same coin. They're two sides of something we call electromagnetism. Uh, I mentioned last class, it was a pretty big deal, a pretty uh, revolutionary simplification or unification when we realized this thing that makes my artwork stick to my refrigerator and that thing called lightning, they're the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin, electromagnetism. So I want to continue talking about that today. Let's, uh, here, let's quickly review where we came, how we got from a magnet to electric power generation, which is where I want to get to today. So just before class, I, was, I, wanted, I knew that this is where we wanted to go, so I googled the right hand rule, and I found a picture that this is exactly what I had in my mind. I was like, oh yeah, that's, that's the picture I was thinking about, right hand rule. So I copy pasted in my um, PowerPoint. And then fortunately, a minute ago, I realized those are left hands. Some jerk put on the internet a picture, and it's, it's one of the first ones that comes up when you Google right-hand rule. And so I, don't, I didn't go view the source of where it came from, but um, I, I almost didn't catch that. But those are left hands, so that's not the right-hand rule. That's the right-hand rule. Okay. So the right-hand rule is when I have any, well, I guess I should even st step back one step, any moving charge is going to create a magnetic field. The, that's kind of where magnetic fields come from. And that, that was maybe a revelation last class, that there's no such thing really as magnetism by itself. It's not a fundamental property of the universe. You get moving charges, that creates magnetism. So any magnet you've ever picked up, I don't think I have, I think this is a magnet right here. It's, uh, any magnet you've ever picked up, the reason it's a magnet, it's not just inherently magnetic, there's moving electric charges called electrons in there that create, that make this a magnet. Anytime I, anytime I have a moving charge, I get a magnetic field. The, my favorite way to do it is to run current through a wire. So when I run current through the wire, I have moving charges. Moving charges create magnetic field. The right-hand rule helps me describe those. So if I put my thumb in the direction of current, my fingers will show me what's, what the magnetic field looks like. And it's these concentric rings that permeate out into space. Okay. Let's see. Then I can take my wire. So there's the simplest picture. That's just a wire in a straight line. I can take my wire, wrap it into a ring. Hopefully you can still, oh, hopefully you can still see what's going on in that picture. I've just taken my wire and wrapped it into a ring. The reason that's nice, you can see some of those right hands, is that I get all of the field. If the current is going from the kind of the bottom to the back, I get all my field sort of funneling up through the ring. And so I take my wire, which has these circles of, of field around it, and I put it into a circle. I get field kind of being funneled up through the ring. You can see that kind of on the picture on the right. Here's another picture of it. 
So if I have that orange ring, if I had somehow magically had current running in that orange ring, I would have magnetic field that looks like that. And you can see how I'm starting to get the magnetic field that looks a lot like a permanent magnet. So if I take several coils of wire, here's the magnetic field around several coils of wire. Now I have what's called an electromagnet. I hope in one of your science classes in like middle school or something, your science teacher gave you a nail and a battery and some wire and a paper clip. If you have never done that, go home and do that. Take a battery, a nail, wrap some wire around it, hook it up, and then pick up some paper clips. And behold the magic of electromagnetism. It's amazing. So that would have got you a Nobel Prize in the 18, 18, late 1800s. Okay. So that is the magnetic field due to some turns of wire. That's called a solenoid or an electromagnet. Notice the similarity. I, a permanent magnet, I've got field shooting out the top and coming in the bottom. Same deal when I'm looking at my electromagnet. Shooting out of the top, that's the north. A north indicates what a fictional other north would feel, and it would be repelled, and it would be attracted to the, to the south. OK. I think that's where we got last class. Now I want to talk about electric power generation. That brings us to an eye clicker already. So if you're, yeah, it's a good time for an eye clicker. While you're thinking about this, oh no, I didn't launch my eye clicker. While you're thinking about your eye clicker answer, also be thinking about whether you want to be one of the two volunteers I'm going to need today. Okay. Okay, while the eye clicker software is booting up, here's your eye clicker. And by the way, this, this question looks very similar to the I click it from one or two classes ago, but there's a slight difference in my wording, which is important. So here it is. When I flip the lights on in my house or in the physics building, about how fast are the electrons moving through the circuit? A, and my software is still booting up. A, pretty much not moving. B, a slow walking pace. C, like 100 miles an hour. D, close to the speed of light. And software is almost up. OK, now we can buzz in. All right. Let's take 15 more seconds. So here's how we're going to get there. I have up here a couple examples uh, that is very similar to how the power company makes power. First of all, I mentioned last class. So here's where we are. I mean, we're almost at the end of the semester. And so I'm glad we reached this moment. And the moment is there's this beautiful link between electricity and magnetism. One can create the other. And so here I have electrons creating a magnetic field. I'm going to use that magnetic field to push on some electrons. I've got some electrons in a big, huge coil of wire right here. Now, if I were to slow, this is a very strong magnet, by the way. If I were to slowly just put this magnet inside, there it is, neither of those lights came on. I'm going to dim the lights a little bit just so we can see it better. So I've got two LEDs. If you remember, an LED is a light emitting diode. A diode allows current to go in one direction. So only one of these will light up at a time. Right now, I have a ton of electrons all sitting near a big magnetic field. 
That's not sufficient to make electricity run. The way I, have to, the way I can make electricity run is I need something to be changing about the magnetic field. That's how we generate electricity. So just sticking a big magnet in my coil of wire isn't enough. If I move or change that magnet, that's what will get electricity run. So when I yank this out, watch that, the, the LED comes on. So notice which one came on? The green one. And when I put it back, the red one comes on. And notice when I stop moving, there's no light. It's only when there's that incoming magnetic field or outgoing magnetic field. So when I yank it out, green, put it in, red. Yank it out, there it is. Okay. So it's when, it's when this coil of wire experiences this large change in magnetic field that something happens, that I push current around. Now notice, pull it out is green. Flip the magnet around, and it'll be the opposite. Because I've got the red, this, the top of the magnet, uh, this side of the magnet is a north, this side is a south, and so the direction of current depends on whether there's an incoming north or an incoming south. So it's as easy as that to generate current. So if I want to generate current, I don't necessarily need a turbine or anything spinning. It's as easy as this. I can get current to run all day long like that. Now, the power company probably, I guess, could pay some guy to sit there and go like this all day long. And, but that probably is not the best way to generate power. So the way to make moving or changing, a little more efficient way to make moving or changing magnetic field is to spin something around. And we've already seen this guy in action before. So here's what, the, but I didn't actually explain it. This is a horseshoe magnet. This is a U-shaped magnet. And inside, you can't see it, inside is a bunch of coils of wire. Those coils of wire are hooked up to this light bulb. So if I spin my coils of wire, pass through that magnetic field, I can generate electricity. So I'm actually, there's actually electrons in there that I'm pushing around by pushing my coil of wire through a magnetic field. Did I kind of have a picture of that? This is kind of what I was doing, that picture. Yeah, that's pretty close. So I'm spinning, in that picture, I'm spinning a permanent magnet uh, really past a coil of wire. This is the opposite. I'm spinning a coil of wire past a magnet, same thing. Now, I think we saw this um, back when we were talking about light or something. We saw that that's, an in, that's a 15 watt incandescent bulb. Here is a roughly 15 watt fluorescent bulb. I can do a little better with that one. And then your public service announcement for the day is go buy LED bulbs. Because this one also takes my, takes my hand cranking and turns it into a lot more electricity. But so what we're looking at, by the way, we're looking at me burning my lunch and doing mechanical work and getting this thing turning, that mechanical work being eventually converted to electricity and then heat and light, and in the case of LED, way more light than heat. Okay, so that's what the power company is doing. The power company is spinning a magnet past a coil of wire and creating voltage and sending it all the way to their house. It's pretty impressive. Let's see, there's a picture of it. So there's a, there's a magnet spinning past a coil of wire. Here's a coil of wire spinning past a magnet, same thing. I've got some kind of like magnet where I've got my north and south arranged. All I have to do is spin my wire past it, and I push on the electrons in that coil. Now, w one upside, I guess. It's pretty much an upside. There's a couple downsides, I suppose, but it's pretty much an upside that of that type of power generation is I get a sine wave out. And the reason I get a sine wave out is because I'm spinning something in a circle. So I get this nice cyclical voltage. And so the voltage is maximized when how the rate of change of magnetic field is maximized. And that's maximized when my field is right in line. Like, that's the opposite. This uh, voltage is minimized in that picture and maximized in that picture. So when my field, I guess I could say it this way, when my magnetic field lines are going straight through my coil, that's when voltage is maximized. But I'm spinning my coil. So I'm going from my field lines straight through the coil to field lines, like in this picture, missing my coil. And so I have no voltage in that picture. And as a result of the spinning, I get this up and down, up and down sine wave of voltage. So when I want to cook my toast, here's how I do it. I plug in my toaster. My toaster is plugged into the power company. 
the power company is sending voltage that goes up and down 60 times a second. 60 times a second, it goes through a complete cycle. Notice, if it goes through a complete cycle 60 times a second, that means 120 times a second, faster than you could snap your fingers or drum a drum, I think. Pretty fast, 120 times a second, the voltage is going to zero in your house. The voltage is going to zero in that toaster. But even more interesting, the current depends on whether it's positive or negative. The current will go through my toaster from positive to ground for 120th of a second. So from now to now, the current will go this way. And then from now to now, the current will go this way. And then it'll go this way. And so there's this idea that is helpful but a little off that when I plug something in, like my toaster, current is running through my toaster. Really, the power company is doing this to the electrons all day long. They're going left, right, left, right, left, right. 120 times a second is short enough time that the electrons basically never get anywhere. They don't move. The answer that I clicker was A. They don't move. Because 120 times a second, I'm actually reversing the polarity. And so that electron goes, you flip the lights on or plug in the toaster and the electron goes, oh, I feel a force, electromotive force, that's voltage. I'm going to go this way. And it does that for 120 of a second. It goes, oh no, I guess we're going this way, guys. And, and 120 times a second, the electrons are, no, we're going this way. Oh, I thought we were going this way. Now we're going this way. And they never really get anywhere. They just kind of jiggle. But anything you're trying to do, like make toast or power your microwave or charge your phone, that's enough just for the electrons to be jiggling for them to be able to use them for power. Let's, speaking of power, yeah, let's talk a little bit more about uh, how the power company gets the power to you. And we talked about, um, yeah, let's go. Oh, I do need a volunteer to demonstrate my electromagnet real quick. I need a volunteer. Yes, please, thank you. So um, here's my electromagnet. So here is, I've got a nice little piece of wood attached to, this is just a piece of metal. This is a piece of metal, here's yours. And yours is attached to a small electromagnet. So if you notice, I don't know if, I don't know if you guys can see that, there is what, one nine volt battery on there? So. Yeah, there's a nine volt battery on there. That nine volt battery is just hooked up to some coils of wire, that's it. So if I put this together, they come apart really easily. Then I flip the, the switch on, let's see if we can do it. Yeah, so this is a 9-volt battery. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> Tug of war. Okay, nice. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, that's a 9-volt, yeah, hand up, round of applause. That is just a 9-volt battery running through some coils. So just a demonstration of you can do a lot with that. I actually have turned it off, and it is still, there it goes. Okay, still magnetized. Okay. So that's, that, is, that is my simplest version of electromagnet, but all that is is just some coils of wire, but that is enough to stick it together to, I don't know, we probably could have hung, I don't know, I won't do that right now, but uh, we probably could have suspended ourselves. Okay, let's see. Um, back to how the power company does their thing. We started talking about this a little bit this la about this last class. The power company right now is sending voltage through this wire. And it's a it's a 120 volts, and that 120 volts is driving current through this solenoid. And I think I have a camera angle for that. So the power company is sending 120 volts to the wall. The wall is plugged into this coil of wire. And so when I turn this on, I have you can even hear it humming. I have an electromagnet. That electromagnet sends current this way for 120th of a second, and then it goes this way. So I have a north-south, and then a south-north, and a north-south 120 times a second. And you can see that, let's see, let's do this guy. You can kind of hear, you hear that, you hear that vibe, that's gets warm. Uh, you hear that vibrating, that vibrating is that rate, that's 120 times a second. So this ring is being pulled, then not, and then pulled, and then not 120 times a second. And so I have a nice electromagnet, but 
it's not just a constant electromagnet. It's actually turning off 120 times a second. So every time that curve goes through zero, I don't have any attraction. I don't have any attraction to my metal ring. Okay. But that's enough for the power company to do what it needs to do, such as turn on the lights. Now notice, this is a completely insulated wire. There's, this, there's no electrical contact. When I, when I put this on here, there's no, no, no metal is touching. There's no conductivity. I'm not powering uh, electricity. I'm not sending electricity through this. This is just the, the core of my electromagnet. But I can still light this thing up through induction. So what's happening is I'm getting a north-south, south-north. That is a rapidly changing magnetic field. A rapidly changing magnetic field, as we saw with my other solenoid and LEDs over there, can, is enough to drive current. So this thing will have current going this way just by the changing magnetic field. Well, I can get current to go this way for 120 of a second, and then this way for 120 of a second. But light bulbs don't care which way the current's going, so that light bulb's going to light up. But this light bulb will be out 120 times every second, too fast for you to see. By the way, I think people in office buildings sometimes get headaches, you may have heard. And the reason for that is these fluorescent bulbs, like this is an incandescent bulb. This incandescent bulb, when you turn it off, it takes a few milliseconds for it to actually go off because it's hot and it has to cool off. You turn it off and on 120 times a second, it's never going to change. But if you have something like an LED or a fluorescent tube that can turn off very quickly, some people are sensitive to the fact those lights are going out 120 times a second. You can't, I can't tell. But some people are sensitive to that. that th those light bulbs actually are off. If you could blink 120 times a second, the lights would be out in here. You got it just, timed it just right. OK, so if I put this on here, so I've got my magnet going, and I can, I can light that light bulb. And yeah, it's still hot. You, I almost cooked it. Okay. So it's still hot. And that light bulb is being lit up by the changing magnetic field on here. That's what the power company does all day long. So here's how the. Here's enough of a picture of what the power company does. Power company spinning a big magnet past a coil. Then one of the things that the power company has figured out is if they want to send power from the power station many miles usually to like the physics building or your house, they're going to erect these tall poles and they're going to put wires up there and they're going to send them across the wires to your house. And the, the more current that's running through those wires, the more power loss or lost energy that there's going to be. It's going to be expensive. They're going to, be, they're going to waste energy in all the current. So the way the power company minimizes those power losses is they jack up the voltage. They jack up the voltage to some, when they're, if they're transmitting it far, a lot of times it's 100,000, 200,000 volts. And so the transmission lines are hundreds of thousands of volts. And that's the really tall ones you see going across the country. Then what they do is they run that very, very high voltage to a transformer, and they step it down, and, they, and then they send it around your neighborhood. Let's talk about how a transformer works. Well, we actually already just basically did a transformer. Here's what a transformer is. A transformer, and this is important for us, is just two coils of wire. That's what we have here. Here's my transformer. That's a transformer. I have one coil of wire, another coil of wire. If the two coils of wire, if the two coils of wire have an equal number of turns, I will just get an equal amount of voltage out of each coil. So I'll put 120 volts into this coil, I'll get 120 volts out. But what's amazing, it's as simple as this. All I have to do is change the number of windings, and I can step up my voltage as far as I want. I can step it up to a million volts, no problem. I can also step it down using the same thing. It's literally our number. Of, it's literally the ratio of the number of windings. And so these are roughly the same. And so this is at 120 volts. So maybe this one's around 120 volts. This maybe has half as the, half the number of windings. So it's at 60 volts. Let's look at another example of a transformer. So I have another transformer over here that just takes advantage of the same idea. So Here's the power company. The power company is sending me 120 volts to this side. If you can see, I've got a I made a noise, and this is scary because I'm about to tell you why that was scary. OK. Um, you can see that there's some coil, there's uh, windings of copper coil on this side. 
And I've got a little label in here. It says this is 250 windings. So there's 250 coils of wire coming. Power company, 120 volts uh, to 250 windings. Then this is a coil, yeah, this is a metal core. This metal core takes the magnetic field generated by this guy and just sends it through this other coil. This coil has 23,000 windings. This one's 250. This one's 23,000. Roughly a multiplier of 100. Roughly a multiplier of 100. So the power company is sending me 120 volts. This side is 112,000. 120. 12,000 volts. Did I do that math right? Times 100. 120. Yeah, 12,000 volts. That's a lot. So the power company, I mean, 120 volts, that's over here. That's enough to kill you fast. This is 100 times that voltage. Let's try it. Okay. I'm going to step over here. Oh, and then by the way, I have that 120 volts, or 120 times 100, 12,000 volts, hooked up to two pieces of wire. Let's see what happens. And so if you've ever, if you've ever wanted to be a mad scientist, you need one of these. I think all mad scientists have one of these. It's a Jacob's ladder. And all it and so what's going on? Okay. So what's going on is there's 120 12,000 volts between these two wires. 12,000 volts between these two wires. That's enough voltage to ionize the air. We, we've seen this before. It creates plasma. The air molecules at that spot down there feel ripped apart. All of a sudden, I have plasma. That plasma can glow, and I get this nice sparking plasma going back and forth. It's actually going back and forth 120 times a second, because that's what the power company's doing. Right. The light bulb on there, that's pretty cool. Um, okay. That's going back and forth 120 times a second. I'm getting electricity going through there. And what's nice about it is that air gets hot. If you remember fourth grade, hot air rises. And so that hot air is actually going to rise. And as it rises, that gap of plasma, or that arc of plasma, actually just goes up in the air. Then it vaporizes. And once it vaporizes, or once it just dissipates up here, I don't have a spark anymore. I don't have current. and the 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 system is going to find the easiest way to make a new one, and it's down here where they're close. And so I get a sort of a repeating process. And sometimes it's just happy to sit right there in the air. There's a sort of a steady state airstream, and I can kind of get the air going by flicking it. But, uh, whoa. Which is also, let's see, probably dangerous, because I could probably, I wanted to. Why am I using a paper towel? Because I it was up here. Um, uh, there. I was trying to get it to I was trying to get it to go through the paper towel. Anyway, um, somebody was cleaning this the other day because the corrosion can affect how well it works. Or, the other day, meaning like 20 minutes ago, and um, so there was a paper towel. Thought I'd use it. Okay. So that's an example of a transformer. This is a, this is what's called a step up transformer. It's a step up transformer. It goes from 250 windings to 100 times that. So I, I multiply my, I step up my voltage 100 times. And so the only reason that is possible, the only reason that works, is because we're on AC power. You can hook up DC, you can hook up DC to a transformer, and it's not going to do anything because the whole functioning of that. Let's see if I, I think I have another, maybe another picture. Let's do that. Or that picture. Sure. So the only reason this is possible is because I have a changing magnetic field. So the power company creates AC power. That makes all the transformers in my house function. A transformer wouldn't work without changing voltage. So I get a changing voltage in, in fr coming from the power company, going into my primary winding, my primary circuit, 30 turns. Then I send those. I send the magnetic field from those 30 turns. I can put it in a straight transformer like this, or a lot of times they're in a square like that. Whatever, same thing. Then on the on the secondary circuit, notice those circuits aren't touching, but I will actually run current through that secondary circuit just based on the changing magnetic field. 
And the amount of voltage, notice I go from 120 volts down to 12 because I have a tenth the number of turns. I can flip that circuit around, plug my transformer in backwards, and I can multiply by 10. So I can take 120 volts, turn it into 1,200 volts. It's really that easy. So here's what the power company does. The power company says, we want to transmit this very far. We're going to generate voltage at the, at the, generate voltage at the power plant. Like I said last class, they're just spinning something. They don't really care what they, how they spin it. So we're going to spin it uh, using the steam coming from nuclear reaction. We're going to spin it using a windmill. We're going to spin it using some burning coal. We're going to spin it using a hydroelectric dam, geothermal. We're going to spin it some way or the other. Once they get it spinning, they can, they're generating their voltage. Then they step it up crazy high so they can transmit really far. Then once it gets near my house, once it gets near my house, they step it down to maybe 10, 15,000. That's what's at those lines up there. So you can see those top lines. So, and they usually send them in groups of three. So they usually send them in groups of two. So those top three lines are my 15,000 volt lines. So the lines running through your house and the lines that the squirrels are running across, those are all 15,000 volts, very hot. And those just transmit, those just go all over the neighborhood. And I think we've stopped noticing them, I think. So next time you're walking outside, look up. I, don't even, I haven't even looked up at UVA recently. I don't, I, I don't know if ours are above ground or below, but next time you're in Belmont, look up. It's power lines everywhere. So then you've got these lines going all over the neighborhood. And then when they get to your house, here's how they get to your house. They're not going to send you 15,000 volts in your house. That'd be nuts. So you can see what you see all over town, and that is a fuse. That's that top little vertical bar at the top. You can see a little fuse. And that fuse is attached to an, another, uh, those are two fuses actually, down to another fuse, down to a transformer. That transformer, that barrel, those are the barrels you see hanging from power lines all over the place. That transformer is just one of these, and it steps it down to 120. Then it goes into my house. And so next time you're you know, outside a house that has uh, above ground power, follow the path. You can see it. it goes from a transmission line, usually hops off through a fuse to a transformer, then out of the transformer straight into your house, or at least straight into your uh, junction box. So there's usually a box outside with the wheel that's spinning so the power guy can figure out how much you're using. That goes, then that goes in your house. And then from the junction box, you've got all those circuit breakers that go to all the different circuits in your house. So your, your house might have a dozen circuits or so, because uh, you don't want to you know, you plug in your toaster and the whole house goes out. So we've chopped it up into different circuits. And a good electrician will chop it up in a, a way that's appropriate. So your bedroom might not need that much power. Your kitchen will need a higher fuse rating. So your kitchen will blow a fuse at 25 amps, where your bedroom maybe 15 amps. And you'll also notice, if you ever open up your breaker box, a couple of those fuses will often have a double, I don't know how often you're in the breaker box, but it'll have a double switch. And that's because like your dryer wants 240 volts. How do you get 240 volts? You just go from negative 120 to positive 120. And hook up two, two lines together and you've got double the voltage. And so your, your, your dryer or your welder, there's only two things in my house that have 240 volts. I don't know what you have that needs that much, but your dryer and your welder. Um, OK, next. Oh, I want to do one more thing with that guy before we move on. Let's go back to that guy. And this is just a fun example of the principle that makes all of this work. And that is, I, I told you before that you can kind of hear it, you kind of hear it buzzing. Um, this is just a coil, uh, this is a, a hoop of metal. And so what happens is, this is a hoop of metal, lots of electrons. So when I get this changing magnetic field, the electrons in there feel a, they feel a force. They, they start, current starts running around in this little ring. And the fun part is, the current that starts running around this ring makes its own magnetic field. A moving current always creates a magnetic field. And maybe not relevant for this class, but we're, I'll tell you anyway, it's called Lenz's Law. Lenz's Law dictates that the current induced in this uh, coil, this little loop of wire, loop of metal, is going to oppose the one that induced it. So this, this is a north. This will make, make another north. They'll oppose each other. And let's see. Let's start with this guy. And I can actually just pop these things off due to the induced magnetic field. 
This one's heavy. It's probably not going to. Ah, less resistance, more current. Yeah. So those are copper. Let's see what the aluminum ones do. Here's a, here's a trick one. Okay. Um, the trick is there's a, sl uh, there's a slice. I don't know if you can see it. There's a slice in there. So current can't flow. So nothing happens. Here's an aluminum one. That one's pretty good. So I can get that guy going pretty high. And before I'm, we're, we're short on time, but before I'm done, I want to do one other thing. And that is cool this guy off a little bit. So I've got some liquid nitrogen. There we go. So I've got some liquid nitrogen. Plop, plop that guy in there. He'll boil. He'll boil the liquid nitrogen for a second because his thermal energy is leaving out to the liquid nitrogen until it's at thermal equilibrium with the pool of liquid nitrogen there. Now that he's colder, we have so many things to talk about in the next four days. There's a, there's a temperature dependence of, of uh, resistance. Most, most materials, including this aluminum, their resistance goes down the colder they get. And you, you could, that makes sense. I think you can imagine why. That the definition of temperature is just molecular kinetic energy. And so if I cool this guy down, the, the aluminum atoms are literally jiggling less. So it's easier for current to run around in there. So I get this guy nice and cold. He's pretty much in thermal equilibrium with the liquid nitrogen right now because the boiling has kind of stopped. So he's crazy cold. No way you're going to miss this. All right, quick. Before Peyton leaves, watch. OK. Well, that's cold. OK. There. All right. OK. Um, so I'll do that one more time. So this guy is nice and cold, so he has much less resistance to electrical flow. Therefore, the changing magnetic field is going to get a crazy amount of current going in that, uh, in that aluminum ring. That is going to generate its own magnetic field, which will oppose the magnetic field here. And by the way, if you thought about it, you might have thought, hey, but I thought this thing was alternating. It is. And fortunately, I think it probably leaves in about one cycle. And even if it didn't, the electrons in here are mobile enough. It's going to, the electrons will start going, create an opposing magnetic field. Then the magnetic field will flip. And the electrons in here will pose that. And so I don't think they're really too worried about it. Let's try one more time. And yeah, you can touch that for a second. Um, it actually, what's going on there? Yeah, that's cold. OK. Um, we have six minutes left. Let's see. I want uh, so much to talk about. Um, let's go back to transformers for just a second. And then the last thing we'll do before we leave, someone has to ride my bike. That's the other volunteer for the day. Um, I think I mentioned last class, Ben King, our local biking superstar, puts out. May, actually, I was going to ask you, how much is a good rower put out? Do you know wattage for a rower? Does anyone know wattage for We have some other crew people in here. Because don't on the ERG machines, don't they ever put out wattage? All right. Yeah, OK, good. So Billy says a good crew person can put out 1,500 watts. That's what a good cyclist can do. So you guys are both good athletes. Let's see. So I'm going to have someone, before we leave, um, power my light bulb and create their own wattage just from mechanical work going into spinning, spinning tire, spinning magnet. But the last thing I want to mention before everyone packs up, still have four minutes left, is these things, which are all over our life. And these things are the end of the electrical picture for, uh, to a large extent. And here's what's going on. Power company spins the thing, makes AC voltage, steps it up crazy high. That's AC voltage. They step it back down to the, at the substation to put it on the transmission line. That's AC. That enables the transformer at the pole to drop it down to 120. That's AC. AC goes into your house. And then you want to plug something in like a laptop or a phone or just about everything you've ever, your printer, everything you've ever plugged in has a brick attached to it. That brick is doing actually two things. It's a transformer. So next time you're plugging one of those bricks, read it because I've, I've never found a transformer that didn't have some nice information on it. It's doing two things. One, it's stepping the voltage down from 120 at the wall, usually to something between like 5 and 12. So your iPhone charger is like 3 to 5 volts, probably. Most of our devices do not need 120 volts. 
So my washing machine needs 120 volts. My iPhone does not need 120 volts. So that little brick that I'm plugging in drops the voltage down. It's a transformer. It's a step-down transformer. But also, it's a DC rectifier. And a DC rectifier takes AC and converts it back into DC, or maybe DC for the first time in its life. And so my laptop wants DC power. So my laptop com comes with a little brick. That brick steps the voltage down from 120 to something like 8 or 10, and also rectifies my voltage. Next class, we will probably talk a little more about how. <laughs> OK, next class, we'll talk more about how a rectifier works. Uh, someone has to pedal my bicycle, but yeah, let's call it a day. Everyone's packing up. <laughs>